Tuesday, Monday, or correction, May 22nd, 2018. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For the agenda tonight, we're going to uh, start with the reorganization of the board. And, uh, we have two public hearings, one with National Grid and one uh, Class 2. We will be swearing in a new police officer. Our representative Mer Meridian's here tonight. Uh, Dennis Westgate from DPW will be here for an update. Uh, we have some recognitions. We will be talking about some uh, various items to include uh, some new notes for borrowing with a bridge and a quint. Uh, we have some end of the year transfers, uh, some donations to accept, a contract to execute with the fire department, some committee appointments, uh, <clears throat> a change to the policy and procedure with military leave, and uh, discussion of the summer schedule. After that, we will be entering into executive session under Mass General Law S Chapter 30, Section 21, Exemption 3, to discuss strategies with regards to collective bargaining. Uh, we are also going to enter executive session mm -hmm. under Mass General Law Chapter 214, Section 1B, exception number 7, and uh, Public Records Law, Chapter 4, Section 7, Clause 26C, to discuss financial assistance to some residents that occurred over this weekend. Uh, we'd like to start with the uh, reorganization of the board. Yes. I'd like to make a motion to appoint the executive assistant, Sandra Hakala, as temporary chair for the purpose of reorganization of the board. Thank you. I'd like to open the nominations for the Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Are there any nominations? Uh, yes. Uh, I'd like to make a motion to nominate Selectman Doherty as Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Second. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I'd like to close the nominations and ask for a motion to appoint Gary Doherty, Chairman of the Board of Selectmen. Second. Second. Okay. Um, so, Gary, you yep. need to rescind. Mm -hmm. okay. I make a motion to rescind the former motion appointing Executive Assistant Sandra Haglick to the temporary chair and thank uh, Mr. Fleming for his service on the Board of Selectmen. Second the motion. Okay. Um, That's, you, you agree with that? Yes. That's a unanimous action. And I also like to like uh, congratulate Brett for his first meeting tonight. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep. So, you have to stick with us tonight. We're uh, going to go a little slow, but so. <clears throat> we just got to wait till 6:05 now for our first public hearing. We got a minute or two. Time we got 6:03. Actually, we could. Uh we can uh, you want to do the minutes? our minutes. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the regular session meeting minutes from April 26th and May 1st and the executive session meeting minutes from May 1st. I second that a motion and you can show that a majority action of the board. What else we got that we can do quick? Yes, yes. Is that from May 1st? Do you have a lot on your report there? <clears throat> uh, I have a few items I can certainly talk about. You want to bang it I'll take quick? a few minutes, but if you don't mind going over. No, that's fine. Yeah. About the moving the meeting. Excuse me? Moving the meeting now, Steve. Oh, yeah, we should probably make the announcement that, um, so because um, last week was our regularly scheduled meeting the Board of Selectmen holds, um, because the election it was delayed, uh, to this week um, but this is also the same um, meeting time as the planning board and they're holding to, uh, they're going to hold a couple of public hearings this evening at 7 p.m. so unfortunately we have to vacate this space at 7 p.m. and then um, take a short recess to go downstairs in the main the main hall where we'll resume the, the remainder of the meeting so just wanted folks to know that in advance and uh, we've worked with Glenn he's going to tape although this is live right now um, he will tape the remainder of the meeting downstairs and it'll be played on, uh, on YouTube, which it typically is. We will be live also. Oh, we will be live. Perfect. So, so, we, 
We can do that. Yeah. Okay. We're going to try to do that. <laughs> Thanks, Glenn. All right, good. I have 605. So, in uh, conformance with Chapter 140 of the Mass Journal Laws, you hear, we are hereby notified that a public hearing will take place on May 22, 2018 at 605 at the Upton Town Hall, 1 Main Street, Upton, Massachusetts, by the Board of Selectmen. This public hearing is being held upon petition of National Grid to install a new pole number 39-1 to service a new booster station for the Upton Wastewater Plant. Josh, can you please come forward? Introduce yourself for the record. So, I'm Joshua Stapleton. I'm the electrical engineer with National Grid. Um, have all the abutters been notified, Sandy? Yes, they have. And I see everything's been uh, properly advertised. Uh, basically, this hearing is for a new electrical pole on uh, Hartford Ave South. Uh, this uh, is a need for a water boosting station, I believe we're installing. Yep. Um, I, think, uh, I guess you guys are doing a bunch of upgrades to yep. the water treatment plant, and I think we're doing a uh, big project over there, replacing a few poles and bringing everything yep. up to standard for you there. So. So. Yeah. so I have a map here. The only thing that looks different is this pole on the opposite side of the street is the rest of them. That is correct. But uh, it's the needed pole for infrastructure for our town. So. Correct. Um, and then we'll probably be having that guy wire, uh, pole 39, just added in. Okay. For the uh, tension purposes going across the street. Any questions, Mr. Spitalian? Uh, I have none. Any questions? No. <coughs> Do any of the abutters have any comments or concerns? Do any citizens have any comments or concerns? <coughs> I'll close the public hearing. Ready for a motion? Uh, yes, make a motion that we accept the plan as submitted to install the new pole at 39-1. I second it. I show that unanimous action by the board. Thank, Thank you, you, sir. Thank you for your time. Yep. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Josh. go for a few minutes there sure I can talk to, um, there's a few things I'd like to talk about tonight um, <clears throat> but the first is um, relative to the fire chief search process um, I think many know and if you don't know I'll say it once again publicly that um, um, chief good good deal is no longer with the town uh, but the town <clears throat> is being led by um, assistant chief Marshan who I have assigned as our fire chief who's really running our ground operations and our tactics and then um, Police Chief Bradley, uh, who I have assigned as the Director of Public Safety for the town, who is overseeing not only the police department, but also the administrative functions of um, the fire department. And so that's been ongoing for, uh, I would say, almost six weeks now. Um, and things are going well. Um, so in, this, uh, in respect to the fire chief search process, uh, we've been advertising the position for um, almost five weeks now. We've since closed the, uh, the application process. Uh, we've had 15 applicants for the fire chief position. Um, and then on June 5th, the board will be entertaining um, applicants um, to convene a search committee for the, uh, and we discussed this at the last meeting. Um, <clears throat> so the search committee is gonna be made up, of, made up of a representative from the Board of Selectmen Finance Committee, uh, two members from the community, uh, one member from the personnel board, and uh, Sandy Hackler, who runs all of our human resources functions. Um, that group is gonna get together with a, um, a consulting firm by the name of Public Safety Consultants, um, who's gonna help um, facilitate this search process. They're gonna do all of our background checks. They're gonna help the search committee screen um, applicants to see who is appropriate for this position uh, in the interim. I expect the, this consultant firm to meet with what I would call key informants in the community. So elected officials, appointed officials, um, folks from the fire department, folks from the fire EMS advisory committee, um, and others to determine uh, what we really want to see as a community with our next fire chief. And so those key informant interviews are so important because that's really going to drive um, the type of skills and abilities we're going to be looking for in our next fire chief. Um, so that's going to, I hope that's going to take, that component is going to take place in the next couple of weeks uh, prior to the June 5th meeting. Um, and then in the end, this, this consulting firm will, um, will do the assessment center. So the assessment center is a really focused um, 
process that uh, puts candidates through a bunch of different scenarios, um, items that we would be looking for, and we would be expecting our fire chief to have, again, those that knowledge, skills, and, and abilities. In the end, um, both my, myself, uh, a board member, and one um, delegate from the search committee will um, sit in the final interviews. We expect two to three candidates to, candidates to come out of the assessment center, and, and at that point, um, we will then hopefully identify that individual who will uh, be our next leader in the fire department. So that's the process. Uh, I know there's been a lot of questions about that. Um, there's been probably a little bit of confusion about that, so I wanted to try to um, uh, summarize that all uh, this evening and certainly willing to entertain any questions tonight or if anybody wants to come talk to me d in town hall, I'm always happy to meet with folks. Thanks there. Sure. We'll pick up later. Sure. So. <clears throat> Uh, it's 6.10 now. We have our second public hearing for the night. Uh, Mr. Ludwig, would you like to come forward? Don't forget to use yeah. the gavel. I, know. You get it. Uh, I must recuse myself from this meeting, <coughs> this hearing, I should say. Thank you. Ready? That's it. I'm ready. <coughs> Be advised, under provision of Chapter 40 of Mass General Law, the Board of Selectmen will be reviewing an application, application of Casiza Ludwig of Master Collision Center requesting a class two license at 75 High Street in Upton. The board will review this application for consideration on Tuesday, May 22nd at 610 at Town Hall, 1 Main Street, Upton. <coughs> Has all notifications and abutters been made aware? Yes, they have. Okay. <coughs> Good evening. Good evening. So we have your, your application here. Um, it looks like you're looking for a class, a class two dealer license. Yes. to uh, sell automobiles? To buy and, s and sell on an auction. Okay. Uh, there's a couple things that we noticed in the uh, application, because mm -hmm. uh, you had to go through a zoning board of uh, appeals, and I see mm -hmm. that they ruled on, it was uh, March 21st, to give you a, a uh, permit. In your application, let me see, is it number seven? <clears throat> it says the uh, cars for sale will be parked in the back lot. Yes, but it's not displayed, yeah. Yeah, but uh, according to their ruling, there would be no cars for sale on the property. No. Mm -mm. So they're just not for sale. The cars we buy, we want to put on the back of the On the back, yeah. But the, the, what the zoning board approved is there could be no cars for sale on the property. No, it's not going to be for sale. It's just going to sit there till we fix it and go to auction and sell. Okay, then you know there's a, a, a bylaw in town that you can only have one unregistered motor vehicle on your property at a time? There's a, there's a town bylaw stating how many cars that are unregistered can be on your property at one time. So. Yeah. Um, it, it, so we ask them like for two spots or three, so we can. Yeah, but we can't. Uh, we can't uh, give you a dealer plate or nothing because it's against the town bylaws. So. But um. Yeah. So I, what I would like to do is like postpone this hearing till June second, and uh, do a little bit more investigation. What? Yeah. Sorry, June fifth. Yeah, maybe go out and do a site visit, talk to you guys. And mm -hmm. really get this all squared away and uh, talk to the zoning and see what they ruled versus the application. If you guys are okay with that, I second that motion. Yeah. Actually, I gotta. So, we're just gonna make a motion to postpone this until uh, June 5th. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yeah. Give me a sure that. Uh, majority action. Chief, you guys ready, or do you want me to go to? Okay. Is a representative well, out there? Here. Here. Is there a representative over there? Does he have a? I didn't know if he had a, uh, something to read for the officer too. He, he, I think he does. Yeah, he does. He's going to do a bunch of things tonight. We're going to call you forward, Representative. Skipping around Thank tonight. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Thank How you for you coming think? again. Thank you for attending the event last week. Absolutely. My pleasure. Um, well, we have a lot to cover tonight, but I'll first thank uh, Selectman Fleming for all of his years of service to the town. It was a pleasure to work with him for my many years, both as George's chief of staff, and then obviously in my role now. I'm very excited for you, Selectman Seamus, to come in 
I'm eager to work with you. Try to continue to move the town in the right direction. So congratulations again. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Um, I come with a couple of things. So first off, I'm not 100% sure that I will be here later, um, but I do have a citation for Barbara Burke to recognize her for all that she did for the town and continues to do truthfully and through her stories and everything like that. I'm also going to try to uh, stay as long as I possibly can before my prior commitment for Officer Bergstrom because I want to congratulate him. But it's great to see many members of the force here tonight to celebrate a new Upton police officer. Um, for those that don't know, I'm a big public safety proponent. I think you'd be hard pressed to find someone as supportive as me. Um, but I do want to come in and tell you a little bit about the House budget. So the Senate right now is in the Senate debate for the budget. Uh, the House budget came out the second week of April. We had, it came out on a Wednesday, and we had until Friday at 5 o'clock of that week to file amendments. So a short amount of time to look through the whole budget, try to get acclimated with it, and file amendments. Then we had all of school vacation week to go over the budget, to look through it, comb through it, see the pros and cons, if you will. The final week of April, we went forth with our budget debate. Now, in the time leading up to the budget, I reached out to the town manager, tried to get some of the concerns of the community, things that we could fight for in terms of earmarks. Um, the way that I always approach it and I advise is attainable, realistic, not the pie in the sky. Um, and I think that Derek did a wonderful job with providing us with uh, the proper things for the town. But we'll tell you a little bit about the budget. The budget uh, includes, on the House side, $4.87 billion in Chapter 70 funding. Uh, that's a $124 million increase over the FY18 numbers that we're operating on now. Uh, if you want to break that down, for Upton Chapter 70, it's going to be $35,359, which gives us an increase of a little over $16,000 from last year. But then you have to look at the Menden Upton School District, which uh, is receiving $12,000. $382,726. That's an increase of uh, a little over $65,000 over last year. Both of those numbers are above the governor's budget numbers as well. The governor, um, whoever the governor is, him or her, files a budget towards the end of January. With all due respect to whoever is in the corner office, that in the House and Truthfully, in the Senate, it's looked at more like a roadmap or a starter. Because our, our budget process is a little bit later in the game, we can see the returns that come in. That's a good thing if the returns are good. It also puts us in a very bad spot if the returns aren't good. Luckily, the returns have looked to be very good. Senate also has their bite at the apple in May, so it's even better for them because they have the opportunity, again, should the returns be coming in, to hopefully distribute more money back throughout the Commonwealth, which makes more money to our cities and towns. Uh, unrestricted general government aids, $550,495. That's an increase of almost $19,000 over last year's numbers. And then chapter 90, uh, to cover our roads, $313,614. So those numbers, chapter 90, if you don't know, uh, like I said, it can be used for maintenance for the roads, equipment, things of that nature. It's based off a formula that takes into account road miles, population, and employment. So that's always a sliding scale, depending on what roads you either take on, employment numbers, things of that nature. A uh, couple of the other big items that came through in the budget, special education circuit breaker is funded a little bit north of $300 million, which is a $19 million increase over the FY18 numbers. I'm very proud of that. Uh, regional school transportation, $63.5 million. So those are kind of the big issue items. Do also want to let you know that um, when the town manager made me aware of one of the uh, earmarks that we could fight for in terms of public safety upgrades and handicap compliance, that we're able to secure about half of the funding requested. So I'm very happy with that. Uh, so. Here's the issue with the earmark process, though. Don't spend it till you have it. And I always caution everyone for that because I just talked to you about the House budget in June. Uh, excuse me, in April. The Senate budget in May. June and July is the conference committee. So 
if there's a difference between $5 million in one budget and $499,999 in another, that still is going to go to conference committee over that $1. A conference committee set up to look at differences in dollar values or in a language change. And so you can come anywhere in between. You can stay with the House number, the Senate number, or somewhere in the middle. Once we get through that, it goes to the House and the Senate again for a vote on the conference committee budget. Then it goes to the governor's desk. At the governor's desk, he has the option to do, he or she has the option to do uh, vetoes. Then the House would act first on veto overrides. So if our earmark was to get vetoed, I would certainly try to fight to have it be overridden. Assuming it gets through the House, then it goes to the Senate for action. Assuming it gets through the Senate, then it goes back to the governor's desk. The governor has the last opportunity, it's called 9C authority or 9C cuts is what we see. Typically they come down sometime around the holidays, realistically in December or so. If we make it through the whole 9C process, that's when the Commonwealth and one of the agencies will reach out to the town, let you guys know that uh, we'll be dispersing the money, and then we can move forward accordingly. So while it's a wonderful positive step that we've secured it, I just want to make sure that we know that we're guardedly optimistic moving forward. I also want to, uh, thank you, I also want to make mention that in my little bit of spare time, I decided to come up with a not-for-profit charitable foundation. Uh, we did our first one last year, and the proceeds went towards local food banks within all three of my towns. So it's a board that decided on what we're doing. Last year was, like I said, food banks. We distributed a $6,000 check to Northridge, to Grafton, and to Upton. This year, the proceeds are going to go towards veterans groups. So we'll be giving back to all of our veterans halls or legion halls. So. It's a wonderful uh, opportunity to give back, and that's kind of how we established it. It's June 8th, if anyone's interested. That being said, I also have a 495 Metro West Suburban Edge Community Commission report. These reports are hot off the presses. Um, basically, what we did was our commission was designed to look at ways that we can improve the 495 corridor. We see all the booming that's going on in the Framingham Natick area, and it's starting to come this way. We know it's coming this way, so we want to be out ahead of it. So I wouldn't do it enough justice if I started to get into it right now, but I will certainly leave it with the town manager. You can all certainly thumb through it, but know that I was a commissioner on this. Um, so I took very seriously as a way to try to grow economically in this district. So that being said, I've taken up way too much of your time. Um, if you have any questions, I'm more than happy to answer. Any questions for the representative? Just a quick one for you. That uh, local aid money. Yes. Last time, I think it was maybe February you came in. Is that number up or down? It seems like it's up. It's up. It's up. So uh, the local aid, the CHEP 70, AGA, everything seems to be up over the governor's numbers. So that's the positive of us going a little bit later in the game in terms of looking at the returns. Now, hopefully, like I said, the Senate's in their debate right now, hopefully they add additional money to it. And I will let you know, whatever, if the Senator is able to secure more than the 25,000 year mark, I'll fight like heck in the conference committee to get the higher number. I'm gonna fight for the higher number and everything. Truthfully, in the chapter 78, that included a $30 per pupil. It started at 20, 20 wasn't acceptable to me. 30, truthfully, isn't all that acceptable to me. I signed on to an amendment for $100 per pupil. Well, that's a real significant jump, one that maybe was a bit of a reach, but I wanted to show my commitment to trying to bring more dollars back to the district. So I'm happy that we were able to increase it. It's not the increase that we've seen before, but hopefully the Senate, in turn, puts a little bit more in there and then we can fight for it that way, too. Great. Just a quick question. So thank you for your representation of the town. We really appreciate that and thank appreciate you fighting for all the money and representing us there at the state level. Um, the $313,000 for Chapter 90 fund, do we know if that's more than last year? And if so, how much more? Or what's, how, where does that rank against last year's? Funding? It's pretty darn close. I think it's about 1300 or so dollars off in the negative from last year. But again, that comes down to a formula. If we took on, you know, if we end up giving away road miles 
if we lost population, if uh, employment didn't grow as high as we thought it would. Got it. The road miles are 58.33 percent on the formula. Mm -hmm. Population and employment's 20.83 percent. Got it. So, so that's it's all formula, sliding. That doesn't really yep. get of that. Yep. Problem. So that's how it's all distributed. It's a 200 million dollar nut, and then yeah. from there the formula breaks it's it down. Thank you. You're welcome. I think it was 314,700 last year. Don't ask me how I remember that, but that was the number. Better, and this will probably better be better than mine. So, so uh, thank you. Yep, thank you for your service again. So I just want to talk about uh, Coach Road real quick, if it's okay with you. Yeah. Um, so as you know, there's talk about maybe the gas station expanding and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Is there an idea what the state may do for the residents in the parking should uh, they expand at all? So I've been made aware of the situation. Um, we're still monitoring right now. I have ongoing conversations with Senator Moore about it. Um, the Housing Authority has done a wonderful job, truthfully, of keeping us abreast of the situation. Uh, as of right now, there is not a, you know, a set in stone plan. I think it's more of the wait and see approach as to what they end up doing with their property. Right. But it also becomes a little bit tricky for us because of the legality side of it. And I know that when it, you know, when it's a, once anything, truthfully, is kind of tied up in courts, our hands are unbelievably tied for what we can and can't do. Yeah. I know uh, we really have much say on it, and I always push the residents towards you guys in the state. But uh, they, <clears throat> they just think we're avoiding the question, so I'm trying to get a good answer for them. No, understood, and trust me, I'm willing to talk about any type of potential remedy or solution for the situation. Awesome. Chief, you guys ready? Yeah. I tried full bus doing long enough. Yeah. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> thank you, sir. Well, thank you all. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, thank you, David. I'll call you back up. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Representative. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks. <coughs> uh, should be, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Ready, Chief. Uh, good evening. We're going to call uh, Chief Bradley for to introduce the new uh, member of the Upton Police Department. Good Chief. evening. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, tonight we have the pleasure of formally swearing in and pinning the badge of one of our newest uh, Upton patrol officers, John Bergstrom. Officer Bergstrom is an Upton resident, a uh, 2008 graduate of Nipmuc Regional High School. He attended the University of Maine where he earned a bachelor's degree in public administration. He joined the Upton Police Department in 2013 as a part-time communications officer. In 2016, uh, John was uh, promoted to a full-time status. In 2017, he was selected for a full-time patrol officer's position and entered the uh, Reading Police Academy in October. In April of this year, Officer Bergstrom graduated from the Reading Police Academy, where he was also presented the Physical Fitness Award for his graduating class. Since his graduation in April, John has been completing his field training uh, program with the Upton Police Department, and uh, he's doing a great job so far, so we're, we're fortunate to have him. So at this time, I'd like to call town clerk forward to give the oath of office to Officer Bergeron. Okay, raise your right hand and repeat after me. I, John Bergstrom, I, John Bergstrom, do solemnly swear, do solemnly swear, that I will faithfully, that I will faithfully, and impartially, and impartially, discharge the duties that come upon me, discharge the duties that come upon me, as a patrol officer, as a patrol officer, for the town of Upton, for the town of Upton, according to the best of my ability, according to the best of my ability, and understanding, and understanding, agreeably to the rules, agreeably to the rules, and regulations of the police department, and regulations of the police department, the constitution, the constitution, the laws of the of the United States. The the laws of the United States. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. In the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And under the rules and regulations. And under the rules and regulations. And bylaws of the town of Upton. And bylaws of the town of Upton. Made under the authority thereof. Made under the authority thereof. So help me God. So help me God. Congratulations. Trying to stay out of the pictures. 
House of Representatives citation. Uh, for everyone here, it reads, House of Representatives, be it known that the Massachusetts House of Representatives offers its sincerest congratulations to John Bergstrom in recognition of the joyous occasion of your pinning ceremony and becoming a member of the Upton Police Department. The entire membership extends its very best wishes and expresses the hope of future good fortune and continued success in all of your endeavors. It's given the 22nd of May, 2018, it's signed by the Speaker of the House, Robert DeLeo, and who I hope is your favorite state representative, <laughs> David Brady. Congratulations. Huh? Say one thing. Thank you. Yep. Board. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Nice to have you aboard. Thank you. Thank you. Congratulations. <laughs> Take care of our people. So, I'd just like to uh, congratulate you, Mr. Bergstrom, to uh, joining the finest police department in central Massachusetts. I look forward to seeing you out there patrolling our streets, uh, keeping our citizens safe. Uh, good luck and be safe. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Thank you Chief. Thank you. Congratulations to his parents. <laughs> Get him out of the house. <laughs> You all set, Representative? Yeah, it looks like all set. So where are we at now? Let's try to get the agenda back on uh, schedule now. Uh, I think we are uh, done. Westgate. Yeah, we're up to you. Next, we're going to call uh, Mr. Westgate, DPW Director, forward. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm with the board. Appreciate you taking time on your busy schedule to see me this evening. Wanted to provide you with a brief, and I'll try to be brief, update of some of the larger projects going on in the, your public works department as well as current activities by staff. So I'll start with the uh, TIF invitation for bid appraisal services. As you know, we went out to bid for our appraisal services. And we have uh, your vote last week was to authorize the town manager to enter into a contract uh, with Donald Walensky, who will be doing the appraisal services for the TIF program. We expect Mr. Walensky will begin his work within the next week. And he'll be reaching out to residents and contacting them individually to set up meetings to discuss the uh, temporary and permanent easements. Uh, Mr. Chairman, if you have, I'm going to go through these. If yeah. you have any questions, stop me at any time and we'll discuss no. them. I think everybody's been provided this copy. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the four log at the DEP requirement, uh, as you know, we engaged a contract with CDM to provide engineering services for um, assisting us with our permitting through the DEP. That, that well has been offline since last year. We were successful in receiving our DEP permit. Uh, we acquired, we purchased our uh, materials and began construction this week, okay. uh, actually yesterday. Um, so this is the installation of a 12 inch pipe, approximately 300 feet long, going from our Glenfield, uh, Glen, um, sorry, Glenview well to our pump station to provide contact chlorination at the wellhead itself. Um, an update on that, as, we, as I took a look at the finances of the, of the enterprise fund and the costs associated with this particular project, as you know, the contract for CDM was roughly $32,000. Uh, 
looks like our pipe and valves and uh, installation costs are going to be between sixteen and eighteen thousand dollars. Looking at the budget now that we're in the end of May, added into June, uh, it certainly seems that I'm going to need to do a transfer from the reserve account. So uh, I'm notifying the board now. Most likely at your next hearing, I'll be requesting to come in front of you to get authorization to move. As you know, we have, I believe, $66,000 in that account to date. And I'll give you an exact figure of what we need to move just to ensure I have enough funding to complete that project. Our goal is to have that well back online prior to July 1 and the heavy demands that are put on that well from the summer season. So I'm sorry, you said it was $16,000 more than the $32,000 $32, correct. $32,000 is for the um, engineering permitting mm -hmm. um, and final sign-off from CDM. Sixteen dollars to $18,000 is the cost of the actual installation of the pipe by us. Got it. So it's the cost of the pipe, the, the valves. Yeah. Um, we're hiring an excavator to do the trench work. Perfect. Thanks. Uh, the Complete Streets Grant, as you know, we were successful in receiving a Complete Streets Grant that was completed uh, October 30th. Um, we are currently working on our prioritization plan, say that three times quick, and hope to have that in place prior to September where we'll have an opportunity to apply for further grants relative to the implementation of that prioritization plan. We had a mandated dam inspection this year at the Old Grist Mill Pond Dam and the Wildwood Lake Dam. Um, the report is available if the board would like to peruse them, but the both dams were listed in fair condition. Most of the um, recommendations that came from the inspection were housekeeping, removing some overgrowth, uh, brush cutting. There was some minor work to the roadway and to some of the concrete itself that we will look into over the next couple of years. As you know, the board, the board probably knows we do these inspections every five years. And that's something, those repairs, you think you can do in-house? We will be doing them in-house. Okay, right. Uh, there's a couple of extensive ones that request that require hiring a diver to come in and take a look at any underscouring of the, um, the stanchions themselves. So obviously I'd have to contract that out. But the majority of the work will be done in-house. Um, our National Pollutant Discharge, or otherwise known as NIPDES permit, was due. Um, and we were able to successfully prepare that for perusal of um, the federal government. It included monitoring all of our outfalls for illicit discharge and mapping of our MS4 system, which is all of our um, stormwater management system. The Hartford Ave North Water Main replacement project was successfully bid out. And this board approved the contract and authorized the town manager to enter into a contract at your last board meeting. That contract has been awarded. We've had our um, kickoff meeting this week and looking to do construction. It's minor what we're going to start with, but construction next week for doing some valve replacement and placement in the um, High Street area of Hartford Ave North and then we'll be the following week we'll be switching over to actually making the tie-in at the intersection of 140 I'm sorry the Warren Street area was where the valves are going and then the tie-in will be at the intersection of 140 and Hartford Ave North that particular particular work is going to require us to do some night work so working with the police chief mass DOT and the contractor um, We've established a schedule that we think will work. The, the schedule will be, it's only going to take one week to make the tie-in at 140 intersection to about Dunkin' Donuts. And that schedule will be 4 p.m. to midnight. Has all the neighbors been advised? Yeah. They are being notified as we speak. Okay. We're going to be putting out four message boards. We're going to do individual flyers to each one of the homes, tax, if you will. So every homeowner will be notified. It'll go on the website. It'll go in the local paper. And we will notify the residents that any interruption to their water service will be given to them in 24-hour notice. Great. How many message boards does the town own? I'm just two. two. And two. we're renting two. You're renting two. Thank you. Uh, Qantas Beach ramp update. Uh, that went out to bid, and the bid closes the 31st of this month. So we're anticipating awarding that bid and that project beginning in June. 
It's not a very large project, so we anticipate it'll be done prior to September 1st. Just quickly getting back to that water main replacement. Yes, sir. Approximately what date, or do you have a rough idea when scheduling, when that will happen? So the actual replacement of the water main? Yes, that it night will, work that'll it be going will begin on. Begin this in two weeks, okay. the night work. At, w within five days, the contractor anticipates he will make it to Dunkin' Donuts in which the water main actually switches over to the westbound lane. At that point, we will go back to day work from eight in the morning to four in the evening, Monday through Friday, and that project should take 60 days. 60 days. Any other questions on that project? No, sir. Nothing yet. Did I miss something? No, I was just contemplating something. <laughs> Question on the Kiwanis project that you said is going to be underway in May? Is that J June. June, sorry, okay. Um, and is that is that based on a plan that was approved by the, I know we went to the state and we got some plans approved and there's, this is just the ramp, there are other components of that, so do we know what exactly? This what work, work is the ramp is, itself. Is the ramp up by the upper soccer field Correct. and from that parking lot down to the soccer field. Correct. That's right. In, gotcha. in my manager's report, I was gonna talk a little bit about <clears throat> um, my trip to uh, Boston okay, in front so of the AAB. So we can talk yep. specifically about Okay. what they've approved of, approved okay. of us. Got it, that helps, thank you. As you know, we're required by Mass DEP regulations for all sewer authorities. The town is required to submit an I&I &I plan, that's an inflow, an infiltration plan, and that's relative to our wastewater collection system. An I&I &I plan identifies any infiltration that we have, an influx and in flows to our plant during heavy rains, which we have considerable here in the town. That I and I plan was approved at our last town meeting, the funding for such. So it is anticipated that we will finish that over the next year and identifying all of our inflow and infiltration areas and come up with a capital plan for correcting that. That's going to be extremely important considering all of the development going on town, in town and looking to hook into our <coughs> municipal system. How much is uh, the fix that these type of issues usually run? The study itself is 113,000. But I mean, on, on average, do you, is it over it millions? Or? A, a section of pipe that we're going to be looking at, um, uh, and I can't think of the name of the location, is about $60,000 to replace about 150 foot section of pipe along a riverbed, okay. which is, we think, one of the strongest areas we're getting inflow and infiltration. Now, you always replace the pipe, you can't put like a liner in it or anything? Some places we can. There are, there are opportunities where we may be able to sleeve it depending on the location. Okay. And we will certainly look at that when we propose it to the town meeting. Storm debris clean, cleanup continues. The good news is snow has ended finally. <laughs> um, and we've been working diligently for many, many weeks now working on cleaning up the brush along the roadside and removing all the dangerous hangers in town. We contracted a company to assist us with the hangers, an aerial bucket truck. Um, and they completed all of the main routes and approximately 60% of the secondaries. So as we speak, we still have some secondaries with some hangers that we're identifying. Unfortunately, our funding ran out and we're looking for July 1 to get them back out there to utilize that particular funding to finish the project. Our, our current crew will be back out next week, continuing on picking up all the roadside debris. Everything south in town and west in town and the main drags are completed. So we're working in northern Upton right now. Still a good two or three weeks of work left to do there. Fowler Bridge replacement is, has completed um, our notice of intent in front of conservation. We're still working with Army Corps for, for finalizing our permits with them. There are some time restrictions on, the, on when we can do that particular work. We're anticipating bidding that out late this season and probably breaking ground either um, fall and winterizing and then picking up in the spring or waiting till spring to break ground. That includes um, the addition of a water main extension across the bridge. And some, some current things that we're working on, uh, obviously Memorial Day weekend's coming up. We, uh, we have dedicated 100% of our staff to cleaning up all the cemetery, town cemeteries and the parks, the, the town signs, 
the parade route. All of the sidewalks have been swept. We've contracted what is a sidewalk sweep, I mean a, a street sweeping company. If you see the truck out, it's a white truck, single truck with one of ours following it around as it's emptying into it. There's about another two weeks worth of work to finish all this. The, every road in town will be swept. The catch basins are being cleaned as we speak. We have contracted with a company to clean all of our catch basins in town. Water bills went out last week. Um, they are slightly later this year in uh, a request that came to us in regards to not having them go out roughly at the same time as the tax bills. So we staggered them. Uh, I would have liked to have staggered them a little earlier, but they ended up staggering a little later, but they have gone out. We are working on our road management plan as we speak. Um, obviously, we have a road management plan. It was developed in 2015. Hasn't been updated since then. Identifies all the roads in town and gives it a, a remaining useful life rating. Um, we'll be coordinating with our water and sewer projects and our capital over the next couple of years, as, long, as well as our five-year capital plan that we get from Eversource to put together a cohesive plan for what roads we're going to do. Obviously, roads that we started next year, last year, we're going to finish this year. We'll be finishing, uh, we'll be starting plow damage. We usually have all of the plow damage cleanup done by now, but because of the late winter and all of the brush management that we had to do, we haven't gotten to the, the damage that happens from the frost coming out of the ground and the plows damaging curbs and side of the roads and people's lawns. And then we'll be back on potholes. Any questions? I do have one quick one. Uh, the Fowler Bridge replacement, I think we spoke about this a few months ago, but uh, I was curious if you had a really solid number as far as what that may cost, and the residents will remember that we received the $500,000 grant for that. Yeah. So the total project is $722,000. $122,000 of that is being allocated through the Water Enterprise account to um, take care of the water main extension and services to three homes. $500,000 is being reimbursed, reimbursed through the bridge program, which leaves $100,000. So basically the engineering costs and permitting costs. And, and correct, correct. Oh, very good, thank you. Thank you. Any questions, Brett? Uh, no, that's great, thank you very much. So, I know you got a lot on your plate, but uh, something that I'd like for us to explore in the future mm -hmm. is um, after all these storms and stuff, I heard it from a lot of residents, there's nowhere to bring your, uh, your sticks. So I was talking to somebody and they were telling me about this uh, plant that they operate in Worcester where you can bring your leaves, your brush, your sticks, and they can kind of like a small recycling plant. I'd like to know, like, you know, is there a requirement for special permits, land, um, like the startup cost, staffing, special equipment? Great question, Mr. Chairman. Um, actually, there is. The, any composting that is done in the Commonwealth is governed by the state. So they have the authority for applying for a permit. They have the authority for oversight, and we have to have trained individuals who understand how the composting works, just like a private entity would. And then we have to report to that how much we take in and how much we give back to the residents each year. Um, as you know, a lot of towns do this. They take in grass clippings and leaves, and they, um, they require that no plastic or other debris can be in there. You can use biodegradable brown bags and then you have to turn that compost over a certain amount of time in windrows until it breaks down and becomes a product that you can actually put out for the residents to get back. The biggest problem that we have with that here is space. It requires a great deal of it. By law, you can only stockpile these windrows so high, otherwise they, uh, they actually become combustible during the summer months. And you have to have the fire department come down and hose them down. Um, so space would be the biggest challenge, but they are a benefit to the town and to the community. Brush is handled very differently. A lot of towns try to come up with a brushing program where they have a facility large enough where they can stockpile brush during the course of the year, and then once a year hire a tough grinder to come in for eight or ten thousand dollars and grind up all the brush. It's something that we could certainly look into. I know you have a lot on your plate, but just something for the future so we can answer some of the questions and concerns. Something more for your plate. Yeah. I'd like to, uh, while you're here, I'd like to jump ahead to uh, <coughs> agenda item uh, 6.3. It's a, uh, it's, let me read what it actually is. This is to, uh, for the, this is for the board to execute a contract with the government for easement for the uh, Hartford Ave South Sewer Project. 
I don't know if you would like to comment on that or anything. Mm -hmm. Certainly. So, as the board is probably aware, where Pulte Homes is a development that is going to put considerable amount of units up at the top of Hartford Ave South. And working in conjunction with the town, they are requiring our water and sewer services. So they'll be uh, implementing water and sewer infrastructure within their development. And to get the services to them, they, it is requiring to put some additional lines and a pump station along Hartford Ave South. It actually crosses a bridge that is governed by the Army Corps of Engineers. And in order to put that force main in there, it requires consent from the Army Corps. The Army Corps has reviewed the plans and is in approval of it, which is why you have uh, a consent form, a consent in, uh, agreement in front of you for signature. And you're happy with uh, how it's all spelled out? And Absolutely. Okay. Any questions on this? On this? Uh, nope. That was my question. Basically, it's it's up to your standard. You you like what you see in it the is. plan? It actually was it actually um, was requested back in 2007 by another company that was looking to do the development up there that Pulte Homes purchased. And because the names changed on the actual consent, I contacted the Army Corps and requested that we update the consent agreement. And they have sent down the new agreement, which is identical to the old one, just for your signatures. Very good. Does this work uh, have any impact on any of the abutters or homeowners or residents in that area? This is a, have you been down Hartford Ave South? It's between the railroad and Glen Ave. Mm -hmm. It's on the, uh, by the dam instead, the abandoned place of yeah. the woods. Sorry. And I know this also is in conjunction with the poll hearing earlier tonight. So Correct. all these projects are starting to tie each other. And so, do you want to make a motion for this one? Uh, motion. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the consent for the town to install and maintain an underground sewer line on portions of the West Hill Dam. Second. Show that unanimous action of the board. Thank you, Mr. Buskett. Thank you. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. We got. We got to move. I think. Is it seven o'clock. Can we should recess. Recess. Uh, what do we got? Ten minutes. Huh? Eight minutes. Eight minutes. Yeah, we should probably recess now. Yeah. Let them come in. Yeah. So, so we're going to recess for approximately five to ten minutes as we all move downstairs. Make a motion. Yeah. Yeah. Make a motion that we recess for ten minutes. Second. All Three quarters of the way through, right? We're moving. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Y
typically speaking, to paint, you have to have paint booth. So if there is no paint booth, then like Sandra said, maybe they're not supposed to be painting. Now, it's always hard to tell if you're selling uh, primer or you're selling paint. And some new back.
Let's see. Am I? Am I up to something down there? I think so. I would have put my jacket on if I knew and brought my gym shorts. I just get it. I think they're ready for us. I don't know. They were they were looking at each other. Then he went back to see Glenn. Well, Glenn was probably nervous thinking we are. <laughs> I think he's got a running machine still. I bet they are. You <laughs> missed that a lot. Yeah. <laughs> we're good to go. Okay. okay. Thank you. So, so sorry about that reset. We uh, recess. We had to move down here because uh, the planning board has a hearing upstairs. Um, so where are we at? I'd like to uh, finish the town manager's report. All right. So just um, two more items I just wanted to bring up. Uh, one, Selectman Simon has just quickly mentioned about um, the Kiwanis Beach area. So I think it's important to try to give an update to the community where we stand with that. Um, and so as Mr. Westby spoke to, uh, spoke specifically about the issue of correcting the upper parking lot and in that ramp, um, that's going to take place shortly, I would say, within the next few weeks. We'll start construction on that. Uh, but as you all know, there's been other complaints that have been filed at the Columbus Beach area. In particular, um, they, uh, there was a complaint filed uh, fire related to the fire pit. Um, uh, lack of accessibility to the fire pit, uh, lack of accessibility to the boat dock, and then uh, non-compliant ramp that leads from the lower parking lot up to the Ramby building. Um, so we received that complaint um, last fall. We received that complaint, and uh, we've been trying to work with the architectural access board, um, trying to educate them on the fact that. Uh, we've already done, uh, the Recreation Commission has already done a, um, uh, a transition plan and an analysis and has identified the various items that they know that they need to correct. Um, and so, um, Andrew St. George and I, we went to the Architectural Access Board on April 20th to try to um, plead our case um, to the board and ask for comments um, so that we could work with the Recreation like, Commission Commission. Um, and use, utilizing the master plan as a kind of a foundation in which we will identify how we're going to fix these problems. We understand where the problems are. We understand we have uh, uh, lack of accessibility. It's on. This, this one's not on. These are all on. I want you to make a difference. Yeah, it's on the bottom. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so as I was saying, so we, we recognize that we have, we, you know, we have improvements that we have to make, uh, but we didn't think at the time it made good sense to throw good money um, mm -hmm. away. And so we asked for time there to correct these two deficiencies. Um, on April 20th, uh, they granted us the first variance, which is for the upper parking lot, although we knew we were correcting it. Uh, we got a variance to uh, September 1st, 2018, to ensure that the ramp is accessible and it meets the standards as outlined in the building code. Um, we got a, we did receive a variance for the, uh, the time variance for the fire pit and the boat dock. So again, just 
we have, we ask them to give us one year so that we can work through the master plan to identify how we're gonna correct those accessibility issues. Um, and we did really have um, board's approval relative to the, the ramp, the walkway, from the lower parking lot up to the Ramsey building. However, there were a few um, opponents um, to that request at the, t at the time of that hearing, and they were able to convince the board not to grant the the, that time variance to the town of Upton. Um, so in lieu of that, what we had to do is, so our argument was simply that, listen, these slopes and the cross slopes don't meet um, compliance, they're not they're non-compliant. Uh, there's no handrail, handrail um, needs to be installed. And so even if we install the handrail, we would still have to uh, remove the walkway and regrade the entire thing. And so we asked them again, you know, to grant us that one year uh, variance request. Th they responded and said that they want two things. They want the grading, uh, which Andrew St. George has provided, and they want um, to do a site visit. So uh, we're waiting for the stay, probably in the next two weeks, we're gonna do a site visit with state officials um, on this very issue so we can get that, that last and final time variance. Um, so I, I bring these up because, again, um, there are bigger issues down in Corners Beach than just the upper parking lot. I know that, um, especially the folks that use the soccer field on the top, um, on the top of the hill really want that upper parking lot open, and it will be open um, as soon as we, uh, we, we, we remedy that issue. But we have other issues that we're trying to deal with at the same time that are ongoing um, that we're hoping to receive some relief from the Architectural Access Board. Um, and so that kind of lends itself to the work that we're doing with this new Disability Commission. Um, at Fall Town Meeting, uh, we went and asked town meeting members to support um, the acceptance of the statute that allows us to create a Disability Commission. That Disability Commission has been created and has been meeting regularly, um, and most recently, at their last meeting, um, to again to show good faith to the to the architecture access board that we're really you know we take this stuff very serious and we're and we're trying to um, you know make progress and improvements on this. We the disability commission has recently um, developed a grievance procedure that adheres to ADA standards um, and a public notice um, as well have both been developed by the disability commission. Um, and thanks to Kelly today, she just most recently created a Disability Commission uh, section within our website, so folks know about it, it's very public, um, and those two new documents have been created. So, um, so thank you, Kelly, for doing that on behalf of the Disability Commission. But, you know, this is really, these are trying times, and, and we know at some point we're going to have to do a transition plan, transition plan for the entire community. Um, but again, it's going to take considerable resources to upgrade our aging infrastructure. Um, and so with that being said, I'm more than happy to answer any questions relative to, to the Disability Commission or, and or the Qantas Beach area. I have none. Any questions? How often does the Disability Commission meet? Um, they're trying to meet monthly. Uh, I think they're a little slow going early on. Uh, last meeting was, I don't know when it was, it was it three weeks ago. I think, yeah, about yeah, okay. three weeks ago. Next June 5th. June 5th, right. So the next meeting on June 5th, okay. And then the tour of Kiwanis with the state, is that scheduled or to be scheduled? It's not, it's to be scheduled. They're, they're aiming for the time period right on the 6th or 7th of June. 6th or 7th of June. Somewhere Will that be there. announced? Is not the public welcome to that or is that? Public certainly there? welcome to that, yeah. I mean, we can certainly announce that if, they, if, if folks feel that they want to be there with the state officials and walk the area. Uh, again, that, that specific site visit is going to focus on the walkway leading from the lower parking lot up to, to the, the Ramsey building. building. That's their main focus. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Thanks. Sure. <coughs> Derek, do you know if we do not uh, fix some of these <coughs> issues, what would happen to the fire pit or the dock? Anyway? Yeah. So ultimately, if, if, we, if there's a determination made that um, because of the, the um, geography, um, of the area that we can, it can't be accessible, um, then we would have to remove those, those um, amenities. And so the Eagle Scouts projects would get torn out, basically? Right, right. The Eagle okay. Scout, both of them are Eagle Scout projects, the fire pit and the boat dock, and if we can't make either one of them accessible within 12 months, then they'll have to be removed. 
and that's our commitment to the state in order to get that 12 month variance. Anything else, sir? Uh, no, that's. Okay. Uh, Eric, a question for you. Are there any accessibility boards or planning commissions that would have funding available in, in terms of grants or funding that we might get from the state to help with all this work? On the state, does have a grant program if you have a transition plan then the state will provide resources in order you to make those repairs that are necessary so yes and that was part of the reason that we did that uh, article at <coughs> the town meeting was so we could apply for the grants okay, good. yeah so that one in particular was for Matt was for the recreation master plan so that grants can be um, could be sought for, for that program um, I, you know, as far as the ADA, <clears throat> the ADA state, sorry, um, disability grants at the state level, I have to check to see if they allow for grant applications specifically for one area in town or if they require the much broader transition plan. Yeah, because we do have a transition plan for the, for the Corn Speech area. What we don't have is a transition plan for the entire town. In fact, although, um, well, in the mid 90s, I think it was when um, it was required by all municipalities throughout the United States to have an uh, ADA transition plan. Here we have some 30 years later, uh, less than 30 percent of Massachusetts communities have a transition plan. So, uh, we, you know, we, we're in the majority, but we're in the majority we don't want, you know, we shouldn't be proud of. And I think that the grievance process that the Disability Commission just Put in place was one of the prerequisites for applying for some of those state grants. Is that do I have that right? That's exactly correct. Yep. Mm -hmm. Great. So they're making progress towards the goal of getting some funding and doing some remediation. Right. And Disability Commission has been doing a great job. Again, new group of individuals just getting together and trying to understand their role. Um, I used to be the ADA coordinator in Worcester for a short period of time. So you know, I, I you know I try to sit with them and give them technical guidance. Um, Janice Nowicki is our ADA coordinator here in town and so she's doing a great job chairing that committee and it's going to be uh, um, a learning process for them but you're absolutely right they are certainly preparing the town so we can go after those grants in the future well, we'll save the questions to the end so we can just if you don't mind you want to uh, we'll go to uh, <coughs> recognition um, as everybody is probably well aware uh, Barbara Burke a resident of the town for uh, 89 years has just moved north to be with her son. Um, I'm actually going to let you talk about Mrs. Burke because you know her a lot better than I do. So. I do, I do. Uh, for many years here in town, she was a school librarian. Uh, back in my days at Memorial School in the 1970s, she was a librarian there. And she held that post for, I can't say how many years. Um, also sat on numerous boards in town. Um, and I distinctly remember back uh, a few years back, some of you may recall, uh, the town celebrated its 275th birthday uh, with a parade and a celebration. And that was a number of years back. And Barbara Burke and uh, Doug Kennison actually were the Grand Marshals. Uh, but Barbara Burke, I remember that event, and my brother actually served on a planning committee for the parade. And uh, Barbara did a great job organizing people, talking, you know, amongst different groups that were participating uh, for the parade and, and things of that nature. So uh, many years of service to the town. Right. I, um, I know Kelly is putting together a, a package so anybody that would like to send anything to Kelly, please get it to her by uh, June 15. I know uh, the representative gave us a citation. Mm -hmm. And then I know we've also talked whether or not if you want to do a, a Barbara Burke, they dedicate one day of the town to her going forward. So, so. Or, uh, we were thinking perhaps it might be a nice idea to commemorate a plaque of some sort, if we could, uh, if you think that would be a good idea? Yeah, I mean, if the board would like, um, Cindy and I can work together and, and um, put together a plaque recognizing Ms. Burke for her dedication to the town over the years and on behalf of the Board of Selectmen, if you, if you decide that's yeah. appropriate. Sounds good. Yeah. I'd be in favor of that. Yeah. Any questions? No, none. Yeah, I'll keep moving on. Okay. <coughs> Moving along. Go to 6.1. Mr. Gawacki. Sorry about this. I'm dragging you along. <laughs> uh. 
uh, sorry, I'm here tonight to present to you for your signature the uh, a note uh, for 1.762007, um, made up of three components, Fowler Street Bridge, the water lines, and the renewal of the uh, Quint um, issuance. I think you probably won't even make a, a, a consider a motion to accept awarding that amount to Unibank, which had the low bid. So if you want to do that, I can wait. Can you give me uh, exactly that number one more time? Um, 1762007. million dollars. Can we get a breakdown on that before I make the motion? If you uh, insist, I'll be glad to. Um, $100,000 um, was for the water main. $600,000 for the Fowler Street Bridge, and the remaining amount, one sixty-two zero zero seven for a uh, renewal of the Quint. Is that the, uh, is that the balance right now currently on the Quint apparatus? One sixty-two zero zero seven, correct, and we already have set aside 50000 for uh, FY19 to pay that down. Pay that down. Okay. Yeah. So that the balance will be one hundred and two zero zero seven. What do you think about a uh, fall town meeting if we don't have a lot of capital just paying this thing off? That yeah, money? yeah. I think that'd be a great idea. Um, so if you want to make that motion. Make, motion yeah. uh, make a motion that we authorize the treasurer collector to refinance these notes in the amount of $1,752,007 uh, to Unibank. I second. That is that. Okay, so. We got a bunch of papers to sign here. You would. I'll start from this end. Can we still be after the meeting? Pardon me? Can we just uh, sign them after the meeting? Do you mind? Can we see them do you want to do that? Yes. Okay. So I'm just going to, I'll leave them here. You just can. Okay. So folks know that the twin is a big blue ladder truck. Correct. And the uh, and the low, the low bid was 1.95 percent, and that's the term is one year. Just so you know. So there you go. You, you, any other questions? So we'll get this executed tonight, and we'll be ready for you in the morning. Yep. Fine. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Thank Thank you. Good. Right, next is we have some end of year transfer. Police and fire transfers. So I'd like to make a motion that we transfer from the police building maintenance to police clothing account, the amount of $2,500. Police building maintenance to police training fees in the amount of $1,000. Ambulance service supplies to fire department utilities for $8,000. Ambulance service supplies to fire department building maintenance for $2,000. Fire Department Training to Fire Department Building Maintenance for $2,000. Fire Department Fuel to Fire Department Building Maintenance for $1,000. Fire Department Fuel to Vehicle Maintenance for $1,000. And Fire Department Training to Vehicle Maintenance for $700. I make a motion that we make those transfers. Two separates. We can keep one. Two more of them all at once. Okay. Also, uh, with that motion, I'd like to make these transfers. The amount of $5,500 tax title for closures and expenses to the treasurer collector wages. $402 tax title for closures expenses transferred to the treasurer collector salary. $1,800 transferred from the town council expense to medical testing. $3,500 from town council expense to town building expense. $4,000 from selectman wages to town building expense, $1,750 transferred from merit bonus program to Mended Upton Regional School District salaries, and $1,750 transferred from the merit bonus program to recreation salaries. 
I second by the question. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. So, um, two, one technical question. When I look at the summary, it says that the state allows transfers up to $5,000 or 3% of the department line items. So presumably the ones that are over $5,000 are less than 3% of the line item on those budgets. Like the eight, there's an $8,000 one and a $5,500 one. I just want to make sure we're not approving something. That changed. That changed with the Modernization Act. Yeah. They're, they're, so that changed. Yeah, yeah that okay. changed. And then the modernization. Okay. Yeah. So, and then the second question is the 8,000 and the 5,500. Can you just explain those briefly, what those are for? The 5,500 and the... The 5,500 one from the okay. tax title foreclosure, treasurer collection of wages, and then there's an 8,000 one. Well, the, this transfer number one for the salary is, uh, they had a transition period. Yeah. And they uh, kept the, uh, one of the, uh, the lady that's salary, she was leaving. Yeah. They kept the only trained other person. Okay. So the training period. Got it. So it's like double paying yeah. for that training period. Right. Right. It's like over time. Right. So yep. Got it. And I think the building maintenance might be part of the generator issue. The building maintenance is part of part of the transfer is the fact that um, our custodian was out on sick leave for a while and we needed to pay for coverage for him. And then um, just to make sure we have enough um, for the end of the year bills um, since it was my first year managing it. I've got a better handle on where we're at, so I think this will get us more than enough for the end of the year. So part of that was to cover his work? To cover his work and and um, maybe some minor overages and some of the other stuff that were happening. Yeah, and then the only other one was the fire department utilities one, the $8,000 one. Fire department utilities, can I see that one? The, 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 the I think that was the generator. Why would the generator be generator the generator? Just put four of that in the warrant item. Warrant From ambulance service supplies to fire department utilities. Utilities appear to be underfunded. Yeah, again, you know, this is. Um, the utilities is just utilities like electric, heat, oh. water. So that's fine. Just the bills are higher than the budget. There's an issue with the water, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I, I just, just so we're clear, we've had a lot of transition this year. You know, Kelly's taken over all the building meetings on top of the technology, as we all talked about in November. Um, and then you know, Chief Bradley is trying to take over the administration and really trying to put together some missing holes from previous administration. So both doing a great job. We'll just, you know, I think next year will be much more seamless than, than this year. Great. Thanks. Thanks. So, uh, no change to the motion. So then nope. first, second. Okay. So now in the second. Okay. We need to do that. So uh, we're at 6.4 and accept some uh, donations. Next we're going to accept some donations in the memory of uh, William Kirk. I'd like to make a motion that we accept the donations in memory of William Kirk. Donations made to the Upton Police Department and also donations made to the Upton Fire Department. Yeah, wow. $300 in the amount for the Fire Department and it looks like $100 in the amount to the Police Department. Second that. Okay, mm -hmm. <laughs> Next we're going to... Uh, Execute an agreement between the fire union and the town. Uh, this is just a one-year contract because of the transition. I'm not sure if you'd like to elaborate on any of the details of the contract. Um, yeah, I'm more than happy to speak to the to the agreement. Uh, you know, normally for folks that don't know, um, collective bargaining agreements uh, are basically an agreement between the, the town and the union. Um, they typically are three-year agreements. Um, Myself and Kelly and the various department heads have been active negotiations with the fire union, police union, and the two DPW unions uh, since January. So what's before this, this evening is um, I thought it was important to try to at least have an agreement with the union. So um, they didn't go without, um, unlike the, the rest of the town employees. And so they were willing to agree to a one-year agreement. Um, That'll get us through this transition period after we hire a fire chief. We'll have a better sense of 
the, the direction of the department, the staffing that, that's necessary for the department, the scheduling that's necessary for the department. So uh, the union, I could say, was very cooperative in, in this round of negotiations. Um, very different than my time in Plymouth, there's no doubt. Um, but I, I guess what I always try to draw to folks' attention in, in police agreement, the fire agreement, we have a tenant agreement between the two DPWs, uh, unions, is that um, each one of those unions have willingly accepted um, for new employees um, to contribute 2% of their wages towards our um, OPEB trust fund. So as we've talked, um, you've talked for many years before I got here, and it's a problem, I think, throughout the Commonwealth that um, there are major liabilities in OPEP um, and in, in most municipalities. Um, we have a $7 million uh, liability today, and I can almost assure us that after we go through the, um, um, the actual evaluation this summer, that $7 million is going to balloon even further north. Um, so. Um, I would say publicly that I appreciate the union's willingness to recognize this as a liability and willing to work with the town so that we can mitigate that. And I use as an example, we pay approximately six, a little less than $600,000 each year to apply by law into our pension obligations. And so that's required by law. And so could you imagine if this legislature that's passed, that would require us to do something similar for OPEP? Um, with our two and a half percent and our new growth, we it was a approximately seven hundred thousand dollar increase. And so if we had to take five hundred thousand dollars of our new growth and two and a half percent and put that just towards OPEC, we would be looking at serious service cuts. We'd be laying off firefighters, we'd be laying off police officers, and we'd be laying off a very small DPW staff. And you heard tonight all the things that the DPW is doing. Um, and so what we're trying to do is we're trying to be years ahead of that and trying to you know, think of creative ways to try to uh, mitigate that liability. So in five, ten years from now, we're not um, posed with looking at service cuts in this community. So again, there's a lot in the agreement, uh, but I think that one really stands out. I think folks should really know what And we should thank the unions for, for their willingness to do that. Any questions on that? I don't have any. Right, any question? Yeah, just a question, and again, I'm new to this, so sorry I'm asking a lot of questions here, but uh, I noticed in the grievance procedure, it looks like you've made a transition from having the Board of Selectmen be accountable for certain appeals and escalations within the grievance procedure and transferred that responsibility to the town manager in terms of the response, et cetera. What's the rationale for that? Uh, great question. So, <clears throat> uh, you know, a lot of these collective bargaining agreements were drafted pre-town manager. Uh, and so in all of our collective bargaining agreements, it gives a step to, so in a, in a grievance process, step one, you usually meet your supervisor, step two, you usually the department head, step three is the town manager. In this case, step four, before you go to arbitration, we go to the, in front of the Board of Selectmen for a grievance hearing. Um, if you read the town manager's act, the, the, um, in the act, it's, it explicitly states that the Board of Selectmen have ceded their authority for collective bargaining negotiations and for grievance handlings to the town manager. Um, and so the collective bargaining agreements actually conflict with the special legislation that's in place. And so what I'm trying to do is to de-conflict those, those areas so that we don't have problems that may arise down the road. Now, I've said to them, to the unions who have raised that as a question, well, we always want one last opportunity to be in front of the Board of Selectmen. You know, they always have one more opportunity and they can go in front of the, the they can go in front of an arbitrator who will hear, who will hear the case and who actually, in my opinion, is, is more of an unbiased um, uh, judge, if you will, than, than anybody in, in town. So, so that's the justification, mostly just to de-conflict the special legislation. So the Board of Selectmen doesn't have any role in the grievance procedure for the, within the fire and EMS department? That is correct. Thank I you. would say my only caveat to that is we're talking about union employees. And so in theory, if a call firefighter who is not in the union had a grievance, they would follow the personal bylaws. And within the personal bylaws for non-union employees, there is a grievance, there is a section that speaks directly to um, going in front of the board of
Got it. And these changes are secondary to the Town Manager Act and the changes that are called out there. So that's where the decisions were made and now we're just catching these that's contracts up with what yes. we've determined for the Town Manager Act. That's accurate. Yeah. accurate. Thank you. To accept the motion. Okay. I make a motion that we authorize Town Manager to execute this uh, memorandum of an agreement with the Fire Union. I second that. Uh, unanimous in action. <coughs> uh, moving right along. So. <coughs> Item 6.7, uh, this was another uh, thing that was, uh, another uh, article that was approved at uh, the annual town meeting. This is a um, military leave uh, policy and procedure. Um, we approved the, uh, the leave time at the meeting, but we didn't have a policy and procedure. And basically, um, Derek has written us a policy, if you want to elaborate any. Yeah, so um, the, um, the town meeting members accepted the statute. Um, so this, if you read the statute, not that you have to, it's very broad. Um, and so the policy speaks directly to the intention of the personnel board. It was the personnel board who entertained this proposal by First Chief Bradley, and then they sponsored the article. And although, if you read the statute, it talks about having the opportunity of 30 days leave, 34 days leave, versus 17 days leave, and the conversation that took place was 17 days leave for, for military personnel. So um, the, accepting the statute because it's so wise just, just isn't enough. So the military leave policy speaks directly to the intention of, uh, the intentions of the personnel board in that it will affect the 17 days of military leave for those folks that serve in our, in our officer, um, forces. Okay. Any questions? No. You make a motion to accept the policy? Uh, yes, I'd like to make a motion that we accept the military leave policy and procedure. I second that. Unanimous you know, section of the board. <coughs> so where are we at now? Uh, next we're moving right along to, um, which one do we skip? 6.6. 6.6. Uh, reappointments. Oh, okay, yep. So we're going to, um, next, at the next selectman meeting, we're actually going to make all the appointments to um, all the boards. But tonight, we're going to skip ahead and do the fire and advisory EMS committee uh, because so they can meet and have a meeting so they can appoint their representative to the uh, fire chief study committee. So, okay, uh, make a motion that we appoint Zach Ward as the uh, on call town employee to the fire and EMS yeah. advisory committee. I'm going to abstain. I don't know if any of these people are going to know about this. Okay. My fault. I'll second that and show it as on. Um, we had reappoint too. We'll do, we'll do this one then do the reappointments. So that, yes, just so that they have the full committee. Yes. We, uh, Cook and Debbie. Yeah, we'll do the, the new appointment then the reappointment. Or do you want to? Okay. So uh, we'll do that as on. We'll um, do those next, next meeting. No, no, we'll, get, we'll do all three of them. Okay. So you want to do that as a second, uh, as a second uh, Yeah, we motion. already made the motion. I second it, so we'll show that as a majority action. And then you okay. can uh, continue with the other two. Okay. So I'd also uh, like to make a motion that we appoint Doug Cook as the paid on-call EMS representative and Debbie Amarelli as the citizen representative to the Fire and EMS Advisory Committee. <coughs> and you're abstaining again? Yeah. I'll second that. And that's a uh, majority action. Okay, where are we at now? Now we're at the summer schedule. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> so as everybody knows, we kind of go to a summer schedule coming in the, uh, the summertime. I sat down with Derek a few weeks ago. Uh, we picked some dates, if I'm not mistaken. It was, uh, we'll meet a regular, at, let me just double check my calendar. It was June 2nd. Did we, did we have another one for June? Um, for, for, for June, we'll see. Regular okay, schedule. June's regular. Year transfer, so okay. We would be, uh, June. June schedule would be June 5th, 5th and 19th. 19th. Okay. And then July of the 17th? 17th would be a consideration. Then, uh, and then the next one was uh, August 14th, we were looking at. So if you guys just want to check your calendars, let, I'm us, good. let us know. I don't know if you guys have vacations planned yet and stuff. So. You good with them dates? Uh, I think I am. Do you want to get back next meeting? or? Yes, why don't we do that? Okay. We'll, we'll get a chance to double check that with the boss. 
So I'll uh, say, so, um, do you guys have any new business? Uh, I don't. I was just going to talk a moment about town meeting, unless you may want to. No, you can talk. I just thought, uh, I thought it actually went pretty well. I thought uh, the questions, I thought the demeanor between the citizens and the board, I thought was very amicable. Um, I thought the questions were, were on point, and I thought there were some line items that were held. I thought it was a very good meeting. I guess that would be the only comment I was going to make. Yeah. Any, any new business you would like? Yeah, if you don't mind, uh, at the discussion of the chair, I do have some new business items that I'd like to talk about. Being new to the, the, the forum here, I would kind Can I of interrupt you for just you one may. second? The other thing I was going to say is there's always a little bit of uh, discrepancy, Except and that date for the minutes. town meeting is yeah. always no, the first know. Thursday in May. Okay. So there's some question about the date, I'll, when I'll it is. Right. I had a resident ask me, saying that they weren't sure when the date was. Want, like, uh, again, that is, like uh, like according to our bylaws, that is the date. It's the same. Obviously, it changes every year, but that is the day in the year when that town meeting is each year. So, uh, welcome everybody for next year's meeting. We'll start getting all that. Got it. Okay. Go so, just a couple things that I think we're in the process for the fire uh, chief search committee and taking applications for that. Is that right? The committee. Yes. Yeah. The committee. Okay. Just right. This, to be a member of the search committee, of we have search two committee. community uh, seats. Okay. Got it. Two community seats for that. So we're recruiting for that. So this is a public service announcement that we're recruiting for that. Same thing with the Economic Development Committee. That's another committee we're trying to put in place? Yes. Okay. These are just public service announcements. Sorry. Um, question on the Board of Selectmen meetings and how we structure them. So I think now we start them at 6. I'm wondering if we should entertain a conversation. We don't have to do it now. We can do it on a future agenda around the time we start, because I've heard from a lot of people starting later, makes it a lot easier for people to participate that have families or are trying to eat dinner or what have you. So if we started at 6.30 or 7 o'clock, we might see if that increases engagement and um, participation. So we, I'd like to talk about that at some point in the future. Um, also, uh, I think new business is where we ask for public comment, but I'm wondering if we should think about uh, having public comment at the beginning of all of the selectmen meetings and sort of set some parameters around it. You know, I know other towns do like five minutes at the beginning of every meeting so the people that come don't have to wait till the end of the meeting because they don't know what time it's going to end. They don't have to sit around for two hours if they don't need to. So doing public comment at the beginning of every meeting, you can limit it to five minutes. It's not a Q&A. It's not a dialogue. It's just sort of seeking information or input from the community before we go through the agenda items like that to be something that we consider. If I could just interject Please. on that one. Uh, um, that is what Select on Silence is referring to is actually quite common in a lot of municipalities to hold public comment in the front for those very purposes he described. So it's, it's not unusual. Yeah. Um, and then scheduling, which I think we're just about to do, is scheduling the Board of Selectmen meetings out a couple or three months so that we can put them onto the website and the town calendar so that folks know when the meetings are going to be held. Um, that would be great. Oh, there's also the mahogany carving behind us when we were at um, an event here recently. One of the folks from the Historical Society mentioned that we should have that dedicated and a plaque put up for the gentleman that carved it and donated it to the town. So I think, Sandy, you've been working on connecting with the Historical Commission to get information on that. So. I didn't know if uh, we should consider doing some sort of a dedication with the Board of Selectmen at maybe a future meeting or something, getting that together and recognizing the artists that did that. Uh, last two things is um, the significant building projects in town. So these are developments and things that the community should know about or hear about, and I'm sure people have access to this through public meetings and the planning board and the zoning board, but the big developments going on are 44 garden apartments off of Miriam Way, so that's one development that's in process, 139 unit condo units, which is up off of Hartford Ave South, that's the Pulte development that people often refer to. There are 56 um, houses that were proposed off of what's called Governor's Landing off of 140, so just be after you go by the Gasco before the carpet and tile. Um, shop up there. There's some acreage there that they were going to put 56 residential units on and now is it, who's the developer? Um, it's Fafford is Fafford, the developer. And his, his newest proposal. Yeah, what's the latest proposal? He's upwards of 280. 
So 280 units of condo inventory there that's proposed. 16 homes off of East Street, which is by the Hopkinton line, so up near where like Angels is. Uh, and then there's just eight lots on Grove Street. The other thing is a two and a half megawatt solar field, which is between Glen Echo Estates and Westboro Road with access coming from Howarth uh, Road. And that's a 72.4 acre site. And I think the Conservation Commission has in front of it how much of that would be cleared to accommodate the solar array. But obviously that's gonna affect the people in those neighborhoods. So I'm sure they've been, I know they have to be notified as abutters, um, but thought we would mention that. So these are things that are just um, on my mind as I've been going around and talking to citizens. The final thing is loan payment. We have a loan that we're gonna be paying off in the next couple of years. And so obviously whenever you pay off a loan, that's gonna create revenue for the town that we can either reinvest in the town or give back to the taxpayers. But some of the big investments that I've heard people talking about that are coming up are, you know, do we invest that money into a library? Do we put it into some kind of a town common redevelopment, which is an active project that's going on and conversations are happening around what we do with the town common and the church. Um, the DPW expansion is something that's been proposed town playing fields with the trash land that we've been donated, so the RETCOM is doing a master plan on that. That's another potential area of investments. Also, people have talked about running and extending water and sewer up 140 to the commercial zone, so again, past where Gasco and the Fin and Feather are, going up 140 to, there to get water and sewer as a way of attracting businesses to our commercial district. Um, so just some things that we'll want to start thinking about and talking about as we think about longer term planning for the community, both in terms of development but also critical investments that we need to make. So that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much for so, the time. The other thing I'd like you to do in the future, Derek, is uh, schedule us a meeting between the Planning Board, KP, and the Board of Selectmen, yeah. and maybe possibly the Zoning Board of Appeals. Is, is there any special time? We're probably thinking. I want to do it the sooner the better. Probably June, maybe, if I yeah. get the Planning Board trying to find a time. Uh, would we want to do it on our off night? Probably, yeah. This is to discuss uh, marijuana, marijuana laws. That way we can have all our ducks in a row when we go to fall town meeting. Because the- uh, Do you want to be on your agenda? Um, I can ask them to see if they, if they have, a, if they have a, a weak agenda, and maybe that's a night they'd be willing to put that on their agenda. And then my, my final question is, I think Marsha had a question about- uh, We'll get there. Oh, okay, sorry, I thought we were at the end. Okay. So, I guess one thing I would comment is we, last year, that was one thing that we entertained a couple of different ideas, really, was uh, Derek had mentioned you could even open up to a cut. A citizen could make a comment to the board where the board wouldn't necessarily respond to the comment. I am in favor of keeping it at the end of the meeting. I think that, you know, it's a busy agenda as it is. I think that we kind of need to take care of, you know, the business part of the town first. Uh, certainly welcome any questions people have, any comments people have, they're always welcome. Uh, but I think that we've got that really penciled in. So I'm not sure that, you know, moving it to a different point of the agenda is going to make it more or less popular. But I would definitely be in favor of keeping it at the end of the meeting, in my opinion. I think, we again, we've got to take care of the business at hand, uh, you know, and then uh, not the comments or questions on business at hand, but you can see by tonight these, these meetings can be difficult, you know, and long and and I think sometimes some of the questions are explained as you go through that's the, the other th right the that's the other thing the is night. the questions that are arisen uh, would most likely may be answered there's a good chance that that would happen and there's uh, another benefit to them sitting through the whole meeting is they actually find out like all the detail you just gave and yeah you learn really gave their, plate, their, their comment they would have been gone right they would have missed out on all the stuff you updated about the development yeah so. and governor's landing you know really for, for lack of a better term that's been on the drawing board for at least a dozen years. So that's really not anything new. Uh, there's just the plan has changed. As, as you had explained, uh, it went from originally a 56 unit to now it may be 200 plus units. Uh, but that is still subject to change. So uh, I'm certainly not, you'd be, you look at that and you think of projected revenue and it's a great number, but unfortunately, but do you want to help us right now? Yeah. Tonight's not the place to discuss this, so we'll That's true. thank you for we'll looking into it. Sure. No, I, yeah. I appreciate that and appreciate the perspective of my more seasoned Board of Selectmen members. The only thing I would say, and, and this is why I mentioned it, is it's obviously the public's meeting. Yeah. So the yeah. business is the public input to what we're trying to do as we're making decisions through the agenda. Yeah. So the main thing is that people understand that 
So is new business where we'd have public comment? Is that what that is? Yes, we usually do yes. that at the very end. Got it. So, so after, I think maybe I didn't understand that new business meant public comment. So that's so. where we open it up to the yeah. public. Or last year's chairman would always ask the crowd, is there anybody that has any questions? Got it. So, so that would be, you know. Yeah, I think, uh, and sure. Derek, correct me if I'm wrong, right? Public comment is less about a Q&A and a dialogue, because then you sort of have this tendency to sort of get into this back and forth between citizens and the board about issues that may not be on the agenda. So you just wanted like a session for them this to This is vent. just five minutes venting, tell us what's on your mind, potential items to put on the agenda for the future. It's not a Q&A, it's not a dialogue, it's not a discussion. It's literally, if there's something on the agenda or something on your mind that you want to propose for a future agenda that you want to give us input about, you have five minutes to do that and we have a chair that will manage that and if there's one person it could never be more than five minutes if there's three people it'll never be more than 15 minutes so i'm certainly not a fan of spending you know an hour going back and forth on things that aren't on the agenda it's really just getting that public input in a way that we can take it in without getting into a dialogue back and forth put a time limit on it uh, and then add any agenda items for the future that we may want to do based on the input we're getting from the community so okay. that that's all i'll look into it okay so, thank I'll you open how you doing? Um, oh, sorry. Uh, I don't think they can hear us anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Marcia Keselowski, Ken Whitney Lane. You were talking about Kiwanis and the things that are out of compliance, and you mentioned the fire pit, which I believe is relatively new. Mm -hmm. how, how did that not get caught before it was built? I don't think do we have policies or procedures in place so that doesn't happen again? I'm not sure. Right. It was the only thing I can say. It was an Eagle Scout project. Um, I think typically these Eagle Scout projects, they sound like great ideas <clears throat> and probably wasn't vetted uh, properly uh, years ago. And I mean, it's probably only five years old or less. Um, and it was built. And it's a great project, actually, if you look at it. It's, it's a beautiful fire pit and folks sit around, but you know, I don't think anyone had any consideration as to is this accessible to, to all users, you know, so. I, think I thought it was new than that. I was going to say it, it would be nice if we had processes and procedures so that you don't waste the poor kid's time. What a heartbreak if it needs to yeah. be removed. I think it was just something that was overlooked at the time. Nobody even thought about it, you know. But plus, it's such a goodwill project. You know, when an Eagle Scout comes forward and proposes that, how do you say no? So well, I'm thinking it probably went for retcon, I'm thinking. Well, as far as the placement, someone must have pointed at something and said, put it here. Yeah. So if they had pulled in the right people, because you, if you go after the fact and try to fix it, it's going to cost money. If you said, instead of putting it over here, put it over here, it's accessible. It saves a lot of money and grief. Yeah, it's something that we want to look into in the future. We never, right? I don't think it was ever thought of until yeah. yesterday. And I would say that the the check and balance on, on the issue you're referring to is pulling a building permit. So the, our building commissioner, he is the individual responsible to ensure that all projects are ADA compliant, are meeting okay. the architectural access board standards. So if this project happened without his uh, his knowing that it was going to take place, then he, he, he would not have checked plans to make sure that it was accessible. Um, and that happens often. You see a lot of projects happen, people aren't pulling building permits, and then you find out five, six years later that it's, it's inaccessible because they never went to the building department and pulled a permit. And I think this project, again, was a goodwill project, and folks didn't feel like they needed to pull a building permit. And I am not even saying if they did, they probably still would have thought it was a goodwill project, right? Oh, you know, this is a great project, this would be great. And probably would have overlooked the fact that it was inaccessible as well. So I don't, I don't think even that would have helped, but that's typically the process that, that should happen. Yeah. When you see the things lined up with the Kiwanis, it's sort of like, can the director step in and kind of monitor that or something? Right. Yeah, Somebody no, I think somewhere. to the chairman's point, I think it's uh, we've all learned a valuable lesson in all this, and it's something close attention to moving forward. We inherited a lot of these problems. No, I understand that. I thought that was recent. That's the only reason I'm going, oh no, it's not still going on. Okay. And the other thing is the 2% the funding with the new contract. Thank you so much. Every little bit helps. That's very appreciated. If, if, if those were real dollars today, that would be $80,000 a year going into the trust fund.
Thank you. Executive session under uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 30, Section 21, Exception 3 to discuss strategic uh, bargaining, uh, what they call it, the bargaining unit. Should we feel that this discussing something will be detrimental? I mean, I walk my number to the other side. And we're also going to talk about uh, Mass General Law, Chapter 214. Section 1B, exception number 7, and public record law. Chapter 4, section 7, clause 26C, to discuss financial assistance to the resident in need. Gary Dardier. Stephen McCallion, aye. Brett Simon, aye. 